security topic. Uh, my name is Daniel. I work with Curity, the organizer. And uh, I work as an identity specialist or solutions architect with our customers and help them uh, implement secure API platforms. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we do that in a cloud native environment. So I'm going to mention a little bit about the complexity of doing these types of environments. And I'm going to stress to you about solutions should be standard based. And I'm also going to give you two real world examples like, of certain problems that happen in these types of environments and hopefully give you a solution to them. So just a little bit of a start. So our universe is changing. We've gone far away from the old client server uh, types of platforms where you build a client for a, a specific backend and you exchange your information and you basic off. Uh, we've passed all of the SOA, architect the SOA architectures and we're now moving into Kubernetes and cloud native platforms that are distributed over geolocations and we are over geolocations and different clusters and we're sharing data in between them, which makes it a lot harder to build those types of platforms today. But one thing that remains constant over this evolution of sorts is that uh, digital identity is still needed. For these types of systems to be able to give you away some data, we need to know who the caller is, or we would need to at least know a little bit about the caller. Is it another system? Is it a user around it? Or who is it? So to address these types of problems, uh, you should, of course, use the standards that are available for you. The uh, problem is that there is a whole library of standards, right? So in relevant standards for API security, it's about 50, 60 standards that are coming up right now. And if you print them, they're probably over 3,000 pages by now. So it's very much information for developers to handle. And of course, we can't really trust that a single DevOps team or something like that could know all of this and be able to handle all those delicate cases that are in there. So I'm going to point out to you uh, the two the centerpieces of these 50, 60 standards. So there's OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, and both of them are, of course, very closely tied. OAuth is a standard for delegating access, and OpenID is a extension of OAuth that gives you an identity layer on top of that. And we've seen an increased trend uh, that people see these st standards and say that, okay, OAuth is not that hard, let's build it ourselves. That's true, OAuth core isn't that hard, it's probably pretty easy to build it yourself. Uh, but since there is a lot of things that comes with it, it makes it a lot harder to keep up with all the changing requirements of your APIs, of your clients, which will make you further or sooner to go into being an OAuth company instead of building on your current product, whatever that is, if that's an API or a client or some sort. Instead, I say use, use a vendor for it. You support a vendor product. Uh, use a support a vendor product that can give you a pluggable platform to be able to integrate your legacy systems, systems that might not yet have support for OAuth or OpenID Connect or things like that so that you don't have to do these types of integrations in your clients or in your APIs. Instead, you do it in a centralized manner, in your center of the universe, so to speak. So let's go into solutions instead. Phantom token flow is something that, um, if you've seen my colleague speaks earlier, they mentioned it, both of them. Uh, it is not a standard per se. It's an implementation of several standards. It's a pattern for secure API communications. Uh, it's a pattern that we use on a daily basis. All of our customers use it in some manner. Uh, we bring another player into the OAuth 
framework, which is the API gateway, or actually just a reverse proxy, but most customers already have some kind of API gateway, and of course we should use it. They have a not, lots of other functionality that we don't need for just this, so let's just consider this a reverse proxy for now. So my story starts here. We already done the OAuth flow of things, the entire OAuth dance, and the client has been issued an access token for getting some kind of data at an API, my left-hand side, uh, on behalf of a user. This token does not contain any information, as you can see. It's just a random string. It's a UUID of some sort that acts as a reference. This token we call a reference token, because it only references data at the OAuth server. You can, an attacker can get a hold of this and can probably use it, but it can at least not gain any information out of it. And thus, so it's the same for the client. The client isn't given any information that it shouldn't have, which is one of the purposes of this flow. We only give information to the players that need it. So in this case, this token is for the API, as an access token always is. It's not for the client, it's for the API. So this token wouldn't mean more for the API either. So the, when it, an API would receive this token, it would have to ask an OAuth server, what does this mean? Is this token valid? This is often uh, fine if you only have one API, right? Uh, otherwise, if you have hundreds of APIs that serves a bunch of requests, then on each request you must ask the OAuth server, is this, API, is this token valid and what does it contain? So that's what the reverse proxy is for. So the reverse proxy, or the API gateway, is in the middle of this. So it intercepts the API call uh, when it tries to get the data and sends it to the OAuth server for validation. Pretty much what you expect. Uh, but in the response of this uh, validation request, there is, of course, the data that belongs to the token, but it is also transformed. It's the same token, but in a different format. The OAuth server can return the token as a JSON web token, a JOT, which is a signed JSON document that is signed with the private key of the OAuth server. And this is a token that is then passed on to the, to the API. So, that means that the API can then validate the token using the public key of the OAuth server and then make its authorization decision based on this token without asking anyone else. So it makes this a little bit more scalable. It also has the benefit of the reverse proxy that can cache this token. Since we, we, saw, we saw the token, we saw it, it's valid, so we can cache it for the duration or the lifetime of the token if it's short enough. So, but consider this. This is the full thing, right? We keep everything on the right hand, right -hand side, uh, the client. We don't have any information, but on the left hand side we have every information we need to make a good authorization decision. An API can trust the information it gets because it's signed, and we can know that it is the OAuth server that issued this information. So, but consider this in a distributed environment where the API, API gateway could be spanning over a bunch of different data centers or geolocations. Uh, having this API call or to make it get cached in all of these gateways could take forever, right? So if we have these many API gateways, it might not even gain the, the um, we might not even get to where a, a gateway has cached a token before, and that's, then we have the validation step only being overhead instead. So for every gateway, new gateway that sees this, we'll have to do the validation. So to mitigate against that, we will have the OAuth server do like pre-population of the cache. When we issue the token, you can also push it out to the, the instances of the gateways. Right? Or, if it's possible in your environment, push it to some central cache of these gateways. 
depends entirely on, on the setup. But this means that on the first API request, the gateways already know if this token is valid and can replace it with the, the value token, the JOT. This means also that we need to talk a little bit about token validation. So what does it mean for the API to be able to validate this, this token that it gets, the buy value token? It looks like this. Uh, it is clear text even if it doesn't look like it like this. It uh, consists of three parts. The pink part is a header. The grayish part is the, the payload and the green is a signature. Those are all basic to four encoded and concatenated with a dot character. But if we decode the header of this, now I'm getting pretty techy in the afternoon, so I hope you guys follow it. But the, the header of this contains an ID and a, um, an algorithm on how this token was hashed. So the key ID is what's interesting right now. This key ID points to the exact key that signed this token. So the API needs to know where to get the keys from the OWA server and match the keys that it got for that key ID. So OAuth has a specification for it called OAuth Discovery. You can fetch all the keys from the OAuth server. You get back a JSON uh, instrumentation of keys, and you can look in your, in your cache, see, I've got this key. I can validate this token. So when, if we can validate the token or the signature using that key, then the data is trustable, trustworthy. But then, in the next request comes a new token with another key ID. What would that mean? Well, it could mean that the server rolled its keys and decided that my old keys are, uh, have been compromised in some way, or I just want to uh, switch my keys because I want to make a more secure environment. So then we need to fetch the keys again and check, did I get this key? If that's the case, then yeah, we're good to go. If we didn't get the keys though, then that means this is an untrusted request and then we should disregard the token. It's not, in, it's not valid, it comes from an untrusted source. This pattern works very well if you have uh, consistent containers or if you're in a virtual machine or something where you can man maintain a state between requests. So if your API is running on Kubernetes or in any other containerized systems, this is not a problem. Uh, we can fetch the keys on startup or, and we can and update them when you see new key IDs and we can probably cache them in some common stores. We don't need to do it for every container that we spin up. Uh, but for Lambda functions or other types of serverless functions, this is a lot harder since we, ha we don't have any way of caching the keys. We are supposed to be completely stateless which would mean we get the overhead for each request of fetching the keys and then validating them, using them. And we don't want that, of course. So we have to come up to something new for this. And, or new-ish, I would say. Uh, what I'm proposing is that we can use instead a certificate. So we can issue a, a certificate that is used in our APIs, and we can distribute it with the Lambda function somehow. Uh, be it compiled in or in any other means of your exact platform. And then we let the token service, the OAuth service, sign each token with a certificate that's based off of that CA. So now we're going into PKI, well, even more techy in the afternoon. So that would mean that an uh, API can prove that the, token, the, the key is used is derived from the CA that I have in my, that is distributed with me. So how do we do that? Well, in the token header, there's no, no key ID anymore. We actually have to have the full certificate in there. So when an API sees this, we can extract this full certificate we can validate that this one is issued by the CA I have in my code, which is hard-coded with me or in other means. 
and then validate the signature using it. So if those match and the signature is okay, we can trust the data. And we didn't have to ask anyone else. We're st still stateless. Uh, yeah, so this is, this might sound complicated, but it's not a really new thing. We have done it before in using SAML standards and things like that. But this is a, an application into a stateless environment where, it, where you get the serverless containers. So uh, I know it sounds techy and complicated, but we can discuss it more if you like afterwards. But I have a few more tips with scaling up this token service, and I'm going to finish with those. And that your OAuth servers your, should be able to scale up in multiple nodes, and those must be stateless. We should be able to run, hit into any runtime node at any given time, and we should be given the same response. Your OAuth server should be able to connect to any cloud DB because you want to run in different cloud environments. You just don't want to tie down just to one. And in OAuth, there are multiple types of endpoints. You have authenticated endpoints on one hand side, and you have uh, unauthenticated on the other, and those give different types of loads. So you want to be able to uh, scale them up independently. So if you have a lot of authenticated traffic, you want to scale up those endpoints, and maybe not the uh, authenticated ones. And of course, all nodes in your cluster must be able to start and stop independently. They shouldn't depend on each other so that if you spin down one, you, you kill all of them. We've seen that. With that, I'm going to thank you all. And if you want to talk to this a little bit more, hit us up in the booth. <laughs>